Hey, welcome to Branch Life Church Online. My name is Josh, one of the pastors at Branch Life, and today is our Good Life series finale. We are closing out the Sermon on the Mount, we're closing out the Good Life series, and we're launching something new, so stay to the very end, and we'll tell you all about what's next. We thank you so much for joining us and being a part of Branch Life Church through these digital worship times. We hope that they're an encouragement to you. We would love to hear from you, so would you take a moment before you log off to go to branchlife.church and fill out this connection card. Let's hear from you. Let's connect. Let's get better together. We're excited about what God has in store and uh, that you get to be a part of it even through uh, these digital times. So guys, thanks for being a part of Branch Life Church. Thanks for worshiping with us. Thanks for giving. Uh, When you give online, God takes those gifts and is doing amazing things with them. Just in a few weeks, we are going to be celebrating baptisms and new core team members at Branch Life Church. We're excited that the church is growing and that God is on the move. If this is your first time connecting with us, uh, we'd love for you to let us know that on that connection card, and we will send you a Matthew journal. We're traveling through Matthew all this year. You can follow along. You can keep notes. You can underline things in your very, very own Matthew journal. So let us know that you are, are connecting for the first time and you'd like the journal through this connection card, and we'd be glad to send these to you. Hey, if you are interested in making it official and joining the team, you can also let us know that on those cards. We'd love for you to become one of our team members at Branch Life Church, and we're celebrating great things. At the end of today's talk, we're going we're gonna to tell you the story of Jared and Natalie Lamos. We're really excited about what God is doing in this young family's life, and they are going to be an example to us about how we take all that we've learned from this Good Life series and we put it into practice. So if you have your Bibles, grab them. If you have your Matthew journals, grab those. We're going to jump in as we finish off the Good Life series, hearing from Jesus in this message from the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go. Grab your Bibles. We're in Matthew chapter 7 or your journals. We are jumping into the series finale of The Good Life. Can you believe it that we've made it all the way through the Sermon on the Mount? And we're going to close up this series. And don't forget at the end, we're going to tell you what's next. Man, as Jesus closes this sermon, he's going to point back to everything that he taught. And he's going to sum it up with three powerful illustrations. And they're all illustrating the same truth. They're all making the same point to everyone who has gathered on, those mount- on that mountain. There were there people there who were following Jesus. There were people there who were trying to find Jesus, try to figure him out. And there were people there that were fighting against Jesus. And what he says to everybody on that Sermon on the Mount as he sums it up is this. Everybody's going to spend eternity somewhere. Everyone's going to spend eternity somewhere. And what you do with the words that Jesus has just spoken matters. What you do with his teaching, what you do with his uh, his truth will affect your eternity. You see, Jesus is talking about the good life. Not just the good life here on earth, but eternal life. And those two are intertwined together. We can walk together with Jesus in this life and the next, and it makes all the difference. Remember, this hill was full of religious people who were seeking after answers. 
They were following institutions and laws and leaders. And they had come to see what this Jesus guy was all about. And that's you and I. What we do with Jesus and what we do with his words will make all the difference. Here's how Jesus closes the Sermon on the Mount. He tells us three stories, gives us three object lessons that are going to sum up everything. He starts with the narrow gate and the narrow path. Then he goes to the tree and its fruit. And finally, he sums it up by asking, are we building our house on the rock or are we building our house on the sand? Let's look at these three pictures together as they aim to answer this one question. Am I religious or am I righteous? Here's the, here's the powerful question that everybody on that mountainside needed to answer. Am I religious or am I righteous? Even those people who think they have no faith, you are carrying some sort of religious belief, some sort of religious assumptions. If I don't believe in God, that's a spiritual opinion. If I do believe in God, that's a spiritual opinion. And is my, is my opinions, is my thought, is my life built on religion, on systems, or is it built on righteousness? That's, that's what Jesus wants to do in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13, all the way through 8, 1. And he starts with the story of the narrow gate. Let me just tell you right off the bat, this illustration changed my life. I want to talk to you about it in a second, but first, let's read it together. He says, that, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. If we were going to sum this up, Jesus is saying in this illustration, our path determines our destination. And this is kind of one of those, oh, duh, truths, right? Like, yeah, of course, our path determines our destination. The road that you on is going to determine where you end up. Growing up in college, we were working with a bunch of camp counselors from this area. My wife and I, my wife was taking a bunch of counselors together. They went on a road trip to Ocean City, New Jersey. A car train of college students heading two hours away for a day of, uh, in the fun and sun on the beach. What could possibly go wrong? These counselors had gathered for this summer from all over the country. Some were from Michigan, some were from Florida, some were from Ohio, and they all were going out to the beach for the day. Some had never seen the ocean for the first time. So they follow each other into the great state of New Jersey, and you and I who've grown up around here know exactly what happened. Uh, right before you get onto the 9th Street Bridge to enter Ocean City, New Jersey, you've got to navigate what New Jersey calls traffic circles. And these are some, uh, some horrible person's idea of how to torture all of us who are trying to navigate the highways and byways. These traffic circles are confusing and to navigate them for the first time can be challenging. Well, they made their way around the traffic circle and onto the bridge and had a great day at Ocean City, New Jersey. Now on the way back is when they got in trouble. This caravan of college students hit the traffic circle and they start going around it and they didn't know which, which way to exit. The leader of the caravan exited and left everybody else behind. He waved out the window, good luck, we'll see you back at camp. And my wife's car was circling the, the circle over and over again, not quite sure which way to go. Don't go on the bridge, that's the way they came from. But where did they exit? Well, they all kind of came to a consensus and they took, took whatever road looked best to them and they started on their merry way. And for the next couple of hours, they had a great time on this road. They thought it was just a fantastic road trip and they couldn't wait to get back to camp and, and, and uh, spend the rest for the rest of the evening. It wasn't until they saw the sign that said, welcome to New York, did they realize that they had been on the wrong path the entire time. And the mistake they made was back at that traffic circle. Listen, we're on this road of life and we're in this traffic circle. And Jesus says, you have to determine your path. You have to determine the path that you are going to follow. And that path is going to make all the difference for you in where you end up. And he describes the two paths of us that, that all of us are on. Remember, everybody is going to spend eternity somewhere. And so if you're a part of the narrow gate, wide and easy, excuse me, the wide gate, it's easy, but that road leads to destruction. The narrow gate, few find it. It's hard, but that way leads to life. Remember I said that this, 
This verse, this story from Jesus changed my life. I was a young man sitting in a class that was being taught by Mrs. Comfort and Mrs. Good. I'm not making up those names. Mrs. Comfort and Mrs. Good had kind of set it up with our class that at the end of the class, if everybody listened, if everybody did a good job, you could come up and you could get candy and you could have that candy and it would be yours so your parents could have all the sugar high problems when we got home. So I was going to sit and listen so at the end I'd be rewarded with candy and I was sitting and listening as Mrs. Comfort and Mrs. Good brought out this story of the wide path and the narrow path. And they said exactly what the path says. And they showed a picture of a wide path with all kinds of people on it. And everybody was on this path. And and they made this point, and it's true, that we all start on the wide path. Everybody starts on this path. And we have to make the decision to change paths, to change gates. But if you don't make that decision, your path, that wide path, will lead everyone to destruction. Some people like to say that, or some people teach that Jesus never taught about hell or destruction, that it wasn't a part of his teaching in his regular ministry. In all three of these illustrations, Jesus is going to talk about the path that leads to destruction. He's going to talk about hell and he's going to talk about heaven. And he's going to make the point that everybody will spend eternity somewhere. Now, in order to get off of this road, this broad path, you have to make the choice to go on to the narrow path. And it's not an easy life being a Christian. It doesn't mean it's going to be a breeze. It doesn't mean you're going to have all the money that you want. It may even be the harder road to take, except it leads to life. I remember sitting in that room realizing for the first time that that's me, that I had to make the decision for myself to become a follower of Jesus. You see, I I had been someone who grew up at church, who grew up with faith, who believed in God, who believed in the Bible, but I had never made a, a personal relationship with Jesus my own. You see, what we are being taught in this passage that there are many religious people There are many people out there that are following a religion or a system of beliefs. They're trying to behave and react in a way that's going to gain favor so that they can end things in the right way. That was me. I was religious. And I didn't even know that I was on the broad path that was leading to destruction. I didn't know that I was driving the wrong way. But in that moment, I realized that in order to enter the narrow path, the path that only few people take, that you have to begin with a personal relationship with Jesus. You see, God teaches in the end of the Sermon on the Mount this, good works won't save bad people. There is no amount of good things that you can do to save yourself. It doesn't matter the amount of good works that you, that, you, that you produce in your lifetime if you're on the path that leads to destruction. He says this, and this is one of the most terrifying verses in all the Bible. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, there are many people out there who are, think they are doing good works in the name of God when they actually are following a religion. You have to be someone who is entered, who, who does the will of our Father who is in heaven. You see, it's not good works that save. It's God's word that saved. It's not our will and our determination. It's God's will and God's determination that saves us. The Bible says that you have to come to a personal moment of decision in your life where you accept the free gift of salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith not of works, lest any man should boast. God says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. So Mrs. Good and Mrs. Comfort are presenting this, and I'm realizing for the first time that I'm not saved, that I'm just a religious person trying to save myself, and that I must have faith in Jesus. And they said, if you want to believe in Jesus, you need to stay in your seat. And I was like, all right, I'm staying in my seat. The problem was, in the very next thing, they said, if you're ready to go, you're dismissed and you can come and get your candy. Here, I think, was the first test of my faith. 
Was this going to be easy or was this going to be hard? You mean I have to stay here in my seat while everybody else runs up and takes all the candy away and I don't get to take any of it home. That, I, I didn't care. I was staying in my seat. I was going to live the hard life, right? I was going to sacrifice for Jesus. I'm staying in my seat. All my friends left. My brother left. Everybody else who was a part of the class went up and got their candy. I looked over the other side of the room. There was a guy named Sam Cross sitting on the other side of the room. He looked at me and I looked at him and I was like, do you want to get ahead? And he's like, yeah, I want to go there. You're supposed to stay in your seat. Yeah, I'm going to stay in my seat. We're like, all right, we're staying in our seat. We waited and we waited and we waited. Finally, Mrs. Comfort came and talked to me. Mrs. Good went over and talked to Sam. And I remember in those moments deciding for the first time to put my faith and trust in Jesus. I accepted Jesus as my personal savior. I realized that I was on the broad road and I needed to go to the narrow road. I prayed in those moments a prayer that you can pray. That if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. I simply said this to God, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died and rose on the cross for my sins. And I want to accept the free gift of salvation. Listen, guys, it was in that moment that I became a follower of Jesus. It was in that moment that I got adopted into the family of God. It was in that moment that Jesus brought me into an eternal life, into the good life that I could possibly have. It was at that moment that I stopped working for God and I worked because of God. I was no longer my works that were going to save me. It was the work that had already been done in Jesus. The angels celebrated. A sheep had been brought into the fold. And my life was forever changed. And Jesus has come to give me life more abundant and to give me life eternal. That same offer is available to you. That, that same Jesus is available to you. If we do the will of our Father, and the will of our Father is that everyone would be saved. If we accept the free gift of salvation, we can have abundant life, the good life, and life eternal. Have you come to this moment where you've put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Not have you been religious. Not have you been attending church. Not have you been doing good things. Not have you been even reading the Bible. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Not have you been baptized. Have you put your faith in Jesus to save you in Christ alone? If you're ready to make that decision or if you're ready to make sure that you're a part of the family of God, simply pray that prayer. Simply have that conversation with God. Tell Him you know you're a sinner, that you believe you died on the cross and you rose again from the dead, and that you want to accept the free gift of salvation. You want to become a follower of Jesus. If you do that, that means this is when your life changes. Not just this life, but life eternal. We'd love to hear from you if you've prayed that prayer for salvation. Let us know by raising your hand in the chat room or let us know on your connection card. We'd love to celebrate that with you. We're not going to do anything but celebrate and just be glad that you have made this decision. You've become a part of the family of God. The second picture that Jesus shows to close out his sermon on the, on the mount is about the tree and its fruit. And this is an important picture for Branch Life Church. Here's what he says about the tree and its fruit. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. Here's the point that Jesus is making with the second illustration. He says religious people, they produce bad fruit. Righteous people produce good fruit. How do I know that's a banana tree? Well, there's a banana growing off of it. I don't confuse banana trees for apple trees because we can look at their fruit and see what they are producing. There's a very important warning in this passage about false teachers. And we can be easily tricked. We can be easily deceived. We can be easily made to believe something that's true, that something that's untrue is true. And there are many, many, many false teachers out there trying to get you to follow their system, trying to get you to follow their religion, trying to get you to follow their beliefs, to buy their books, to read their blogs, to, to buy into their businesses. And in the name of religion, there are many institutions out there that are deceiving us. 
that are deceiving our friends and our neighbors and our family members? How do we know what's true and what's not? How can we have the wisdom and the ability to see what is wrong and what is right, what is true and what is false? Jesus says you will know them by their fruit. Here's the even scarier thing. Inside the church, you will have people that will come dressed like sheep, but underneath, they're wolves. They will look good on the outside. That religion might look good on the outside. It might seem shiny and nice, but on the inside, it's rotten and it's evil. I know that, uh, I, not to pick on any one religion, but I'll pick on Scientology because it's been kind of in the news lately. And Scientology is a religion where a lot of famous people have gotten to be a part of it. And here's the interesting thing about Scientology is Scientology will not let you see what you believe or what their story is until you level up. It's a lot like a video game. You have to kind of buy into their first level teaching before you get to their second level teaching. And you have to buy into their second level teaching until you get to their third level teaching. And it's not till the very end when you get to the last level teaching that you realize that Scientology believes that there is an alien from another planet who's going to zoom down in here and take everybody away with them. If they would lead off with that, everyone would be like, I'm out. I don't want anything to do with this religion. I don't want anything to do with this faith. But they start hooking you in, getting you in at these smaller levels. And then you're invested and you've given tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you've, you've kind of moved your life into their systems and into their beliefs and into their community. And by the time you get to the stuff where you're like, that's not right, you're already overly committed. You're already, already in the deep end. And it's hard to get out. We do that with all kinds of religion. And, and what, what's, what's even more true, particularly about Scientology, is those that have gotten out have said, hey, there's nothing but rottenness in there. There's nothing but bad fruit and control and manipulation, and they're trying to come after your money. One of the things you'll find out about false teachers is they can be controlled by money. They can be controlled by, by the allure of money. Even some, some professing pastors or teachers or religious leaders will water down the truth. They'll avoid the hard truths because they don't want to offend people. Why do they not want to offend people? They don't want people to go away. Why do they not want people to go away? Because they want their money. They want their security that they bring. Listen, I'm, I am not a pastor. I am not in this for the money. I want to be able to present to you the truth. I want to give you the truth of the word of God and have it transform and change your life. See, we want to determine our, our direction by the fruit that results from it. How do you know what's a good church and what's a bad church? Well, the Bible says, hey, you'll know them by their fruit. But let me give you this warning and this encouragement as we talk about this passage. It is absolutely important that we guard the church, but we don't divide it. We want to guard the church. We want to be all in with good, godly theology and doctrine. We want to teach that stuff and we want to warn against uh, other religions or other faiths or other teachers who go against the gospel, who will go against Jesus Christ. You see, the devil's two primary weapons are deception and division. He wants to deceive you by false religion, but he also wants to divide you because we know that we are better together. So we want to be careful to guard the church and not divide it. You see, we can be overly accepting of teachers, of preachers that we see on TV, of books that we read, and we can take it all in and we be like, oh, that sounds good. And we can just run with it and overly accept it. We have to be careful to trust but verify. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, it talks about the Bereans who were commended by God because they took what they were taught and they compared it with Scripture. We've got to take what is being taught to us out there and we've got to compare it to the whole of Scripture. We've got to make sure that it matches up, that truth lines up with truth, and that the gospel becomes the most important thing that we use in our lives to see what else is out there and to, and to screen it. But we can also become overly cynical. We can start throwing stones at brothers and sisters, at other churches who believe the Bible, who believe the gospel, and we can start calling them out and tearing them down or tearing down the church as a whole. Have you ever seen someone who is trying to call out false preachers saying, hey, the church has a problem? 
And they start, start tearing down the church because of someone who has taught something different than what they believe, but not necessarily against the gospel. We've got to be careful about those two things, and we've got to give grace. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 says that we have to fight for the unity of the church. So only say that which is edifying, which builds each other up. If someone's teaching something that you don't agree with, it's best to go to them personally and talk it over, not to put them on blast out for the whole world to see so that we can build confidence into the church and into the truth of God's word in the people around us, not destroy it. All right, now let's jump to the final picture that we have in this closing of the Sermon on the Mount and where Jesus says rock or sand. You see, when it comes to the good life, when it comes to everything that Jesus taught, he's going to lay before you a choice. Do you listen to my words? Or do you set them aside? Remember, Jesus' words were radical. Jesus in these moments was asking people to follow him. He had just said, beware of false prophets. In other words, he was saying, test me. Test me. Check my fruit. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you need to see what Jesus did with his life. The fruit that he bore. The good that he did. Whether his words were true and trustworthy or whether they were false and would not last. Jesus stands the test of time. Jesus is the prophet that we can follow who is full of truth. And he says, hey, build your house on rock or build your house on sand. See, Jesus teaches that only God's word saves bad people. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And when the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock, the rock of God's word. Listen, this has been a hard year. This 2020 and 2021 has been difficult, but Christians of all people should be able to have a calm confidence in the midst of the storm. Why? Because we know our house is built on the rock of Jesus. We know that our house is built on something that will last. And no matter if climate changes or politics change or countries change or education changes or, or my health changes or my relationship changes, no matter if all of that falls apart, I am able to stand with love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. I'm able to lead other people into a relationship with Jesus. I'm able to do good to my neighbors around me and be a source of strength for them because my house is built on the rock of the word of Jesus life. Not on my own good works. I'm a bad person full of sin who has been forgiven by the grace of God. Man, this picture is a powerful one. And he says, listen, religion is built on good works. Righteous is built on God's word. When we are righteous, we follow after God. We follow the words of God, not the works of man. Remember, everyone will spend eternity somewhere. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 26, it says, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. When the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. We have a choice to make. Am I going to follow the broad path or the narrow path? Am I going to follow the teacher that has the good fruit? Am I going to build my house on the rock or am I going to build my house on the sand? Lastly, Jesus says of religious, their end is destruction, but of the righteous, they have eternal life. This is the story of the good life. This is the radical teaching of Jesus that blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who grieve, who mourn, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For those who want enter, to enter into the good life, to live in the kingdom living, we make Jesus our king and we follow his words and it radically transform us. It's unbelievable when he calls us to love our enemies. It's unbelievable when he says that we're not supposed to even be angry towards other people. It's crazy to say that the that, that word of God is what Jesus is built on and we follow those words. It's radical thinking that Jesus was presenting time and time again throughout this entire series. But he says, hey, if you build your house on me, if you build your house on this rock, you will be able to live the good life and bear the good fruit. So are you building this house on the rock or the sand? We want to tell you a story of the Lamoses. 
Jared and Natalie have been good friends of mine for years and years and years. And today is a bittersweet day in the life of Branch Life Church because we are sending Jared and Natalie out. Jared and Natalie are answering the call to go into full-time ministry. You'll hear in their stories that Jared is a, is a truck technician, that Natalie is, works at a daycare, she's a, a pre-education teacher, and that they've been committed for many years now to do whatever God would call them to do. And one of the things that God called them to do was help plant Branch Life Church. Jared's wearing his Branch Life Church in that picture. And they've been a part of everything that we've done at Branch Life over these last three years as we've started and launched. And we've been excited to have them not only as team members, but as team leaders and as group leaders. And God has used all of this to prepare them for this call that he's laid on their life. And God is calling them to an opportunity to become the head cook at High Point Camp. And this is a ministry position. He's going to change jobs. He's going to change houses. He's going to change churches. He's going to change focus. And he's not doing any of it for the money. He's doing it all because he believes God is leading. You see, Jared and Natalie are an example to us today of a family that is committing to live the good life. They want to build their house on the rock of Jesus Christ and not on anything else. We're excited to celebrate them. We're excited to pray over them. And we're excited to send them. And as you hear their story, are you someone who's following after Jesus and the words of Jesus? Are you ready to build the church of Jesus together and do whatever it is Jesus asks you to do in this life? If you have not yet put your faith and trust in Jesus, we want to ask you to consider that. And if you are a follower of Jesus, we want to ask you, like Jared and Natalie, to go all in with your faith, however Jesus would lead you. Here's their story. Hi, I'm Jared. I'm Natalie, and this is Tilly. And we are the Lamoses. I grew up going to East Brandywine Baptist Church with my grandparents, and I was saved <laughs> in Sunday school when I was about six years old, and I realized that I just wanted to love God and follow Him. Um, and then I was baptized in 2014 when I was 17, um, and have decided to really live my life for Him since then. And Kind of like Natalie, I was raised in a Christian family. I went to church, um, but I didn't really have a heart relationship with Jesus. And it wasn't until after we got married that um, I really understood the necessity for having a genuine heart relationship with Jesus. And that was 2015. Um, and then in 2019, I got baptized at Branch Life Church and have been following Jesus since. So, Natalie and I didn't really meet for the longest time. We went to the same high school. I knew her brother, and that's how we kind of met over online. Um, we talked over Skype, um, a, lot, a lot of that. Facebook Messenger. Facebook Messenger, yeah. Um, I went off to college, so we kind of lost touch. And it wasn't until I came back that we finally decided to meet in person. Um, we met in person, we started dating, and it was actually a really quick um, dating time between dating and getting engaged. In 2015. In 2015, yeah. Um, and we got engaged for 42 days and got married. Josh married us. And then two days after we got married, we moved to Florida. So after graduating Josh's youth group at East Brady Wine, uh, we became a part of the youth staff, helping out wherever we could. Um, and when Josh had told us that he was start, starting to think about planning a church in Pottstown, Natalie and I, we got excited about it, but we were like, well, maybe we should pray about this first. Um, so we spent a lot of time in prayer and reading the Bible and just trying to figure out what God's will was for us in that, if he wanted us to go or if he wanted us to stay. Um, and ultimately, um, God was calling us to be a part of Planting Branch Life Church. For me personally, being a part of Branch Life Church has been yeah. one of the largest um, growth moments in my life. I've learned so much. Um, I've been a part of, um, well, we've been a part of um, 
doing the host ministry, leading small groups, um, helping out wherever we can. Serving in the nursery. Serving in the nursery, yeah. Um, and we loved every minute of it. It's uh, near and dear to our heart. Branch Life has become like our family. Um, they've been there for us in times where we've just been some serious uh, issues, I guess. <laughs> um, and um, we've been for them. For, uh, we've been there for them as much as we can too. So we've always been open to ministry, even though I'm just a truck technician. And I'm a daycare teacher. Um, but we've always felt God has kind of drawn us towards going into ministry. Even back when I was in college, planning a church, I just, I've always known God had that direction for my life. I just didn't know where or how. Um, and it wasn't until really when I went to Chile in 2019 that God really lit that fire on my heart, um, the desire to go full-time into ministry. He wanted to move to a different country. Just pack up everything, just, little, just go. And yeah, I was not ready for that. <laughs> and um, so, you know, we patiently were waiting for different opportunities, um, praying. We, we served where we could. Yeah, we served where we could. We were, you know, doing as much as we could at Branch Life while maintaining a full-time job. And um, then a, um, a ministry opportunity opened up at High Point. Um, to be a kitchen coordinator and when I heard about that I was like that's insane because I love cooking and I love working with kids and I love sharing the gospel and so like it just seemed too perfect too tr too good to be true and so we prayed about it and talked about it and seek counsel from our pastors from our friends prayers from everybody that we could and um, as we were going through that path, it seemed God had opened that door wide open for us. So So here we are, moving our whole family and leaving our jobs to go live at camp. Yeah, and um, it's, been a, it's been a wild ride, but we have a lot of peace knowing that God has guided our whole family and our whole lives to, to go into ministry and, and serve Him with everything that we have. If you could be praying for us as a family, as we're making some big transitions, a lot of life changes. Um, I, like I said before, we're gonna be packing up our whole family and moving to camp. Um, so just be praying for a smooth transition as we move there, as we live there, as we change our lifestyle. Um, praying for Natalie as she is gonna be adjusting to a new life, uh, new schedules, just not having me there as much. And be praying for Tilly as she's uh, gonna be growing up in a whole new environment. And um, for us, as we're expecting another baby. <laughs> so, a big thank you to Branch Life Church and just the big role that they've played in our lives. We love you guys, we're gonna miss you, um, and we'll be praying for you guys. Hey, we want to pray over Jared and Natalie as we send them out. Would you pray with me as we pray this prayer? Dear God, as we send this young couple and, and Tilly out and the, the new baby that's on the way, we celebrate their lives and, and your call in their lives. And Lord, though we are sad to see them exit our, our church and enter into another program, we, God, are thankful that we are building the kingdom together. Would you cover them with your power and your grace? God, would you help their ministry to be fruitful and there would be many, many people that would be encouraged in their walk uh, with Jesus, that would be encouraged in their service with Jesus, and that would come into a relationship with Jesus because of what they're doing at camp. God, we pray that you would bless them for this decision and that you would provide for all of their needs. We pray that as Tilly and her new baby brother or sister grow, would they grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us all, God, to plant our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. So we're super excited about, about Jared and Natalie's future. We're super excited about the future of Branch Life Church as we seek to be a church that's deeply grounded in Jesus so that we can bear good fruit and do good things for our neighbors around us. That's the mission at Branch Life, to help you grow deeper in your connection to Christ so that we can together reach our world. 
And we want to continue building on what God is asking us to do as a church. And look what happened in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 and 1. It says, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For what he was teaching them, he had authority, not just as one of their scribes. And when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. What's next for Brand New Life Church is we're launching into a brand new series. And here's what we're saying. Join the crowd, follow Jesus. Join the crowd and follow Jesus. Join in on what God is doing here at Branch Life Church, what God is doing in our region around the world as we build the kingdom. And for the next several weeks, we're going to look in this new teaching series about following the leader that's Jesus. Will you be a part of it? We hope that you'll fill out your connection card. You'll let us know. Uh, if you made any decisions about your personal walk with Jesus, if you've been encouraged in any way through the Good Life series. But maybe for you, your next step is just joining us next week as we launch this branch, uh, or joining us June, uh, July 11th as we launch this brand new teaching series. We hope that you'll be a part of it, and we can't wait to see what God has in store next. We'll see you next time.